Overwatch has a long competitive history. From Apex tournaments in the early days, to contenders, to Overwatch League, to World Cup, there have been countless ways for these players to prove themselves. Many fantastic players have suited up, but only a couple of them were good, and of those, only a few were great. Only one of them, though, can hold the title of the greatest Overwatch player of all time. One of those great players, who some claim is God's gift to main tank, is the one, the only, Super Team Fortress. While nowadays he's one of the most popular Overwatch players of all time, at one point, he was just a high school dropout with the dream of making it big in the Overwatch League with the San Francisco Shock. When he joined the Shock, he was still too young to play, so he had to wait until March to debut alongside Sinatra. Unfortunately for Super, by that point, the Shock were pretty bad. While he was solid in his debut, it wasn't enough to turn the season around, and they still finished 9th place out of 12 teams. The next season, the team made a lot of important signings, including players we will see later on the list, and to say they turned it around would be an understatement. What would happen in the upcoming season was a level of domination people who see Super's cosplays dream about. Super is without a doubt the greatest American Reinhardt player of all time, and debatably still the best Reinhardt to ever do it. And during the GOATS meta of 2019, literally all he had to do was load into the server and play Reinhardt. He helped to lead the Shock to a stage where they didn't lose a single map, eventually winning the season of the Overwatch League in his hometown in Philadelphia, where I met Jeff Kaplan at the airport. While he didn't play in the playoffs, it was just because he was playing alongside another tank player who perfectly covered his weaknesses. Super was still a good Arissa and Winston, as he would sometimes demonstrate, but he played with Smurf, who was just better at those characters. In the next season, the domination continued, as the Shock got even better. Super got to flex his muscles in the post goats era, showing off his Roadhog and helping them to win their second straight Overwatch League championship. In his fourth and final season in the league, he got more playing time to Ryan actually being pretty good, leading them to finish sixth place in a heavily shortened season, and finishing fourth in the playoffs, losing to the Atlanta Reign. Super also led the USA to win the 2019 Overwatch World Cup, which I may or may not already have a video about. He was also the face of the league, appearing on Jimmy Fallon's show twice, definitely by himself to represent the game, and prove that Overwatch players are not losers. I wish they'd chosen someone better for that. To this day, Super continues to represent the game, bombing out of Ludwig's esports GOAT competition and losing the award for best FPS streamer three times in a row. The main detractions from Super's legacy are that he played for a great team. And while that's true, he was always necessary on these teams, subbing in for crucial moments or different metas. He was also more flexible than he was able to show because his Winston was actually good. The guy in front of him was just probably the best Winston player to ever do it. Super was a fantastic player and the face of the league, and those achievements make him one of the greatest players of all time. But he's not as good as the next player on the list, who may seem like a bit of a controversial selection. He has a very polarizing playstyle, and some people like to call Lee Jagon, Fee Jagon because he always had the spawn room calling to him like the Green Goblin Mask. When the league began, Lee Jigon was too young to play, so he kept grinding in tennis with Runaway, with Gangnam Jin, Yaki, and Hisu. When the time finally came, he joined the Shanghai Dragons, with what would eventually become one of the greatest rosters ever assembled. There was one point in time where they would play a future finals MVP, an MVP, a top five at least flex support of all time, and the consensus greatest off-tank player of Overwatch 1. It was with this team, of course, where he won the Overwatch League Championship in 2021, where he, of course, played a major part, setting the pace with his Mercy and Brick. That's the major detraction of his career, too. His teams were absolutely loaded. Even the Boston Uprising team he played for in the final season was basically a collection of the best Overwatch players ever. It is true, though, that Lee Jagon feeds a lot. He loves to die but he is also genuinely a fantastic Lucio player. In this clip, you can see that there are two sides to the coin that is Lee Jae Gon. He has the primordial drive to die as quickly as he can, but he is also the best mechanical Lucio player ever, and it seems that he can be in a perfect position when he actually wants to be. Alongside his Lucio, he's also a very good Brig player, and has a serviceable Mercy. He can create unreal value with any character, and it just depends if he wakes up on the right side of the bed that day. He's still adding to his legacy today, playing for Fnatic who low-key suck, but Lee Jae Gon will never change, and will remain unpredictable until the day he retires. The next player is the one and only Chinese GOAT. Lee has always been at the top of the Chinese Overwatch scene. When they were a joke in the early days, he helped to prove that they were legitimate reason with Miraculous Youngster, having close games against top teams like Lunar Takai and Runaway, who were better than everyone else in the early days by far. He won an MVP of early tournaments, winning over $100,000 of prize pools, though at one point, he was suspended for three matches for quote, negative speech. He played for the Chinese World Cup team in 2017, where he was the bright spot on a decent roster, and they finished second in 2018, where he absolutely dominated. After that though, he disappeared. Like, fully. He didn't touch the game for two years. He was probably in school and secretly grinding rank, because when he first played for the World Cup team in 2017, he was 15 years old. Before he graduated high school, he was signed to the Chengdu Hunters, and he made his two-year hiatus look like nothing, picking up exactly where he left off. And while Chengdu kind of sucked in his first year, 
He eventually helped them turn it around, winning MVP in 2021 and finishing second in the 2022 Countdown Cup. When the Hunters disintegrated, he joined the Spark to form a Chinese super team, where they finished third place behind their strong team play and chemistry. Basically, the same roster also finished second in the 2023 Overwatch World Cup. And now they make up LGDOA, who are pretty good. Leave is one of the best tracer players of all time and definitely a top two echo and probably not too. Leave also played for some stacked teams, but his pure dedication to the game, his raw mechanical skill, and his seemingly endless hero pool proves that he's one of the greatest Overwatch players of all time. But the next player on the list is arguably the only Chinese player better than Leave, that being the primal blade himself, Gu Zhui. He first broke onto the scene in the 2018 World Cup, demonstrating his godly Winston skill. This guy was so good that players better than him, who had been playing for years by that point, were studying his gameplay, and they couldn't replicate what he was doing. It took other players years to catch up to Gu Zhui's Winston, and by that time, he was already the star player of the Hangzhou Spark. While the team had problems with almost constant roster churn, Gu Zhui was a rock, repping the pink and white for five years, every year of the team's existence. Unlike other tank players on the list, Gu Zhui is actually a good female cosplayer, proving his dominance of main tank over other fraud femboys. If you want to date a beautiful Asian femboy, you should like this video and subscribe. Also, consider clicking the join button to help me make more videos in the future. Anyways, let's face facts. Gu Zhui was a one-trick. This forced the Hangzhou Spark to sign other tank players to cover his weaknesses, which was every tank besides Winston. Luckily for him, Winston was almost always good, but when Doom became a tank in Overwatch 2, he became truly unstoppable. He picked up the hero effortlessly, and he quickly became one of the best three tank Doomfist players, and in the 2023 World Cup, he showed that he was leaps and bounds ahead of everyone. And he or Monk probably would have won MVP if they had won the World Cup. Gu Zhui is one of the most influential players of all time, and he's still growing. He is a small hero pool, but he has truly mastered all the characters he plays, being probably the greatest Winston ever and one of the best Dooms to ever do it. The next player was at one point the Aura God. He is legendarily jacked. He is the fumbling octopus. Jonak was at one point the best Overwatch player in the world, and it wasn't even close. Jonak's dominance in 2018 was so ridiculous that coaches on other teams would just have their flex supports watch his highlights and yell at them when they couldn't do what he was doing. Yes, he was being pocketed by his team, but that's a chicken and the egg scenario because he was already the best player around before he was getting pocketed and only got better after it started. You might say that he was playing against plumbers and line cooks, but that's really not true. 2018 was actually when the league was stronger because there was so much investment in the game. Many great players were too young to play, but there were still incredible players in the league and Jonak was still head and shoulders above the rest. Jonak continued to play Excelsior League for the Excelsior, finishing third in 2018 and 19, and third in Asia in 2020. Of course, taking home MVP in 2018, being permanently etched into the game's history through his MVP Octopus and Yada skin. While his later NYXL teams underperformed, it really wasn't his fault. If Shu went from Mano to Yokpung for his tank, he probably wouldn't win that many games either, regardless of what season it was. People say that Jonak wasn't great in the playoffs, but that's really misrepresented. A lot of NYXL players underperformed in playoffs, especially in 2018, with the sandbagging scandal. But outside of that, he was really never at fault for the team underperforming in the playoffs. Availability is the best ability, and Jonak was a model of consistency, playing every single map for NYXL and never being subbed out for any reason. He is so incredibly dedicated to the game that even his dog's name is Chorong. While people don't hear about him much after his dominant season in 2018, I would argue that he was so good in that season, it makes up for being relatively quiet after that. And even then, he was still the best player on the roster most of the time. The next player on the list may seem like an interesting pick, but he was once the most hyped player of all time. And a bidding war for his talents that got so crazy, it ended up bankrupting his team. Sparkle was the best player on the best game in Korean contenders, but he was too young and couldn't play quite yet. So he continued to hone his skills, especially on Genji, and even converted to Islam to enhance his abilities. <laughs> With his new faith in a law established, Sparkle joined the Paris Eternal, who assembled what is probably the strangest roster ever, being half French and half Korean. And these guys were seriously good. They won the 2020 Summer Showdown in what is one of the best Overwatch matches of all time, and finished fourth overall, where in a normal year, they would have made the playoffs. After his signing, the Eternal had no money left, and Sparkle left for the fuel alongside Hanbin, Fielder, and Rush. Basically meaning that the Eternal spent all that money for good players for nothing. With the fuel, he was able to expand his already crazy hero pool, working on his Tracer and Echo, and playing his signature Genji. They finished third in 2021, and in 2022, they played in what would become another one of the best Overwatch matches of all time in the Grand Finals, where Sparkle would flex his muscles on Reaper, which was probably the least flashy character in this composition, leading him to not get the props he deserves to the win. Sparkle was one of the best DPS players in every season he played in. He could play literally anything they needed him to play, and after he stopped raging all the time, He became a joy to be around, winning the Dennis Avelka Award in 2021. Sparkle's peak compares to the best, and in 2020, he was definitely the best DPS player, I don't care what anyone says. His Genji is probably the best ever, and his DPS Doom was also one of the best. 
He isn't playing currently, and I hope Allah leads him down the right path, but all I know is that Sparkle is one of the best to ever do it. The next player on the list was at one point Sparkle's fuel teammate, and will definitely be a controversial selection, so please hear me out. Decay has one of the worst reputations in Overwatch League. People say that he collapsed the 2019 Dallas fuel, but he was honestly just a passenger on the Titanic, as they were already just cooked. But Decay started his career with the LA Gladiators, where he got the debut his Zarya and Goats. He was amazing. The team honestly just kind of sucked at goats, as they were never able to find a really reliable break player, and Roar is Roar. He then played for the Fuel where he was labeled a diva and was scapegoated for the team's collapse. But at the end of the season, he was basically illegally traded to the Washington Justice. He never should have been allowed to join this team as the trade deadline had already passed, but somehow they acquired him right when the playoffs started and he carried them so hard. This level of carry was ridiculous. The Justice sucked. They finished 19th in the regular season and third in the playoffs. Just mental. His play after that was up and down, honestly. He was pretty streaky, but when he was at his best, he was literally the server admin. He was a fantastic Widow and Tracer, but he is in my mind the greatest Zarya player ever. No one has ever had that much value on a hero in the entire Overwatch League, and because of that, I think Decay at least earns his spot at the table. The next player on the list is one of the true OGs of the game. With the name so good, Rascal could never stop screaming. Bird Ring started his career off with what would eventually become the second best team in the pre-Overwatch League era in Kongdu Panthera, who would later be picked up in their entirety by the London Spitfire for the inaugural season. He was mostly a sniper specialist in London, and formed a perfect pair with Prophet, who was the second best player in the Overwatch League in 2018 though Birdring was still equally important to the team that would eventually win the championship. Birdring's involvement in that win is heavily understated, as the Spitfire were most definitely the better team and Profit was definitely the best player. But Birdring's Hanzo demanded so much attention that teams couldn't just focus on stopping Profit. They formed one of the best one-two punches in the league's history, but the narratives remain that Profit was solely responsible for the win. He continued with the London Spitfire in 2019, where he didn't see much playing time because of Ghosts, but it was already a tough time for DPS players and Guard was basically a break specialist. Afterwards, Birdring joined the LA Gladiators, who didn't have the greatest roster in the world in 2020, but they improved drastically for 2021, and Birdring played a huge part in their fourth place finish in the, in the regular season, pairing perfectly with Kevin Sweet. The young man even received MVP votes. This was a major return to form for Birdring, who once again looked like one of the best players in the game. He retired soon after, later turning for the Boston Uprising, where he again looked very good leading the team to finish 4th place in basically everything. Birdring was a player of immense peaks and valleys, but his peaks were so insanely high and the valleys were more due to factors outside of his control than his play actually getting worse. He remains one of the best Widows of all time, and I would say he probably is the best Hanzo ever. If he was treated like a real human with a pulse during goats instead of being used as a human heating pad for the bench, I think a lot of people would look at Birdring differently but he still has the resume to be considered one of the greatest Overwatch players of all time. The next player on the list is without a doubt the best DPS player of Overwatch 1. Profit started his career with GC Busan, where towards the tail end of the pre-Overwatch League era, he was tearing it up. He was definitely the most hyped up DPS player, and with the London Spitfire, he truly dominated on every character he played. He was the best tracer with very little competition, and because I'm talking about him in this section, I would say he absolutely carried the Spitfire to winning their championship with Tracer, and he had highlight after highlight. This guy was so untouchable, he flipped off the player camera, and they still let him keep it pushing. During GOATS, he wasn't a great Zarya, but he was serviceable. With this whole dynasty, he continued to dominate because Tracer stayed good, though his Hanzo and Genji also improved, and he led them to second place in the 2020 playoffs and a 2022 kickoff clash championship. Profit played on some truly bad Spitfire teams, and some pretty bad soul teams, but he was always the bright spot. He also elevated his game in the playoffs. When I say he carried in the 2018 playoffs, I am doing a disservice to this man's back muscles. Playoff P, but the opposite way of Paul George, is real. And even in 2020, he was still able to raise his level in the playoffs, basically carrying what was on paper not a super good team to the finals. Profit has the consistency, peaks, and playoff performance to keep himself up there with the best. I will never hate on anyone for saying that he's the GOAT because he is truly a dominant player. He's retired now, but he left behind his son Profit to become the GOAT in his place. The next player has played with the greatest teams in the world twice. Fielder started his career playing with Sparkle on the Paris Journal for a fantastic team. Fielder was signed mid-season and helped to legitimize Paris's half-French, half-Korean approach. This guy was nutty. He helped them to win the 2020 Summer Showdown playing all the way from Korea on millions of ping, where after winning, he sat there, lifeless, waiting for it to all be over. This is the face of a stone cold killer. He moved on to the Dallas Fuel with Sparkle and Hanbin, where he continued with his dominant Anna and Baptiste play and paired up with Chio, who was a perfect compliment to Fielder. Fielder isn't a crazy aggressive player, but he does exactly what he needs to do and he really doesn't die. He makes the right decisions almost every time. He played for the Atlanta Reign in the final season of the league for one of the best teams ever assembled. At that point, he was already known as the best and he continued to maintain his reputation, helping his team to dominate the regular season, though they didn't go as far in playoffs as they should have. Now he is making ungodly Saudi oil money playing for Team Falcons, so good on him. Once again, the biggest thing you can say against Fielder is that he always played for good teams. 
Support can be a lower impact role, but his consistency helped to ground teams that had a lot of, we'll say, personality on them, including but not limited to Sparkle, Sparkle, and Sparkle. Fielder was the rock for a lot of great teams and helped them to be great consistently, and that's why he has a candidacy as a GOAT of Overwatch. Next up is the main character of the Overwatch League. Fearless was at one point somehow expected to be able to turn around the god-awful Shanghai Dragons after they started the first season 0-10. He couldn't do it obviously because they sucked donkey dick, but the pressure got to him. And instead of returning for next season, he chose to play for the Dragons contenders team where he played to prove himself for almost the next year. When he came back to the Dragons main roster in 2020, things were completely different. First of all, the team was actually good. They had two players who were already talked about on this list and other great players filling out the roster. But of them, Fearless was one of the standouts. He was able to play a lot of Winston, but showed off a decent ball as well. They finished first in the regular season behind Fearless's performance and it was clear that he was now one of the league's premier players. The next season though, he left to join the upstart Dallas Fuel. The Fuel were missing just one piece, a leader. And Fearless fit into that seamlessly, probably because he already knew most of the people from his time with Element Mystic. They absolutely tore it up. And once again, Fearless led his team to first place in the regular season and led them to become Overwatch League champions where he took home the finals MVP. He played the last season with Houston where he played well, but he didn't play in the playoffs because of his limited hero pool. Fearless is the protagonist. He had the comeback from 0-40 to finals MVP. He has the narrative. He is a fearless leader who made every single team he played for better, except for the Shanghai Dragons in season one, but come on, they were beyond saving. He was the anchor for these teams. And despite not being the best at many tank heroes, his leadership more than made up for that, solidifying himself as one of the best players of all time. The second to last player, and the person who I would say is the second greatest Overwatch player of all time, is someone I've talked about before. The only Overwatch player with CTE. When Violet was first signed to the San Francisco Shock midway through the first season, people knew he was going to be good. But no one could have possibly predicted that he would be this good. Well, he started off kind of slow because the Shock were trash, in the second and third seasons of the league, it was basically like he was given creative mode because he brought havoc to every server he played in. He fit perfectly with Goats because he could farm infinite damage with Zen, and because Zen is slow, he was literally unable to feed. The Shock were the best team in the league, and while Super and Sinatra were the MVP candidates, Violet was the quiet hero. He and Moth complement each other perfectly. Moth played slow and cautiously, being a fantastic in-game leader, and Violet was the complete opposite wanting to die as much as possible, but being so mechanically goaded at the game that other teams just couldn't kill him. He was the best Anyata player ever, for sure, and it's not particularly close. But in Season 5, when the San Francisco Shock brought Finn up from 0-2 and he only played flex support, Violet took one for the team and switched to main support for the first time in his career, picking up Lucio and Brick. There was a learning curve, and at times he still struggles with Lucio, but he's improved dramatically. If Violet wasn't bored by playing Ana, he would be one of the best players at literally every single support in the game. Not to mention, when he eco-swapped the DPS for the Shock, he was still good. And when Kiriko released, he didn't even have to switch roles anymore. He could just play the best DPS hero in the game within his role. He is the best Zen, one of the best Baptiste, a fantastic Lucio, and among the best Kirikos as well. He will never play Ana, and the stupid thing is, he never has to. He is just that good. If you say Violet is the best Overwatch player of all time, I have no criticism. My choice for the greatest of all time takes into account history, but it's largely speculative. With other people on the list, they've already had long careers, but my GOAT, he's just getting started. Before that though, I have some honorable mentions. Shoutout to Shu, Smurf, Hanpin, Eveltal, Kevster, Shy, Merit, Striker, Pelican, Happy, Fate, Shio, Fleda, Izayaki, Choikyobin, Void. Some of these people have an argument to be the GOAT already, and others could prove it in the future. I especially want to mention RuPaul and Sugar Free because I think they're absolutely nutty and have a chance of becoming the future GOAT. But finally, it's time. The greatest Overwatch player of all time. That was a close contest, it's clearly Lip. This guy's whole career since he joined the Overwatch League has been nothing but dominance. But before he joined the league in 2019, he was an absolute nobody, playing for a pretty bad team of contenders. He went completely unnoticed until people started discovering him on the ranked ladder. The Shanghai Dragons picked him up and during his first show match, he demonstrated what we would go on to see for the next five years. Complete, unadulterated, unfiltered, un Unstoppable domination. In the following season, the Shanghai Dragons worst result was third place. Basically the only move they made the season before was adding Fearless and Lit, and they improved to the point where they were the best team in the league by far. The playoffs meta was pretty unfortunate for them, and still they finished third place in a close match to a team whose roster was absolutely perfect for such a weird meta. Next season, the Dragons worst finish was second. They got even better, not because they changed the roster, actually very little changed. But Lip somehow just got better. Playing in a real competitive environment did Lip wonders, and he found a second gear, finishing first place in the regular season, second place in the Widowmaker contest in a close loss, and oh yeah, winning the Grand Finals MVP too. This guy made so much money this year, $105,000 off of individual awards, and his split of the $1.5 million Grand Finals prize pool. And he's 6'8". God, why couldn't it be me? 
In basically just three years in the league, he became the third highest earner in Overwatch history, behind people who have won multiple championships and been in the league since it started. And by the end of the year, he will be second easily. In the final season, he formed the greatest Overwatch team ever assembled with the Atlanta Reign. While they didn't end up winning the league, Lit played great the whole time, and he and Stalker fit together perfectly. He then moved to WAC, who would eventually become Crazy Raccoons in OWCS. They are by far the best team in the world right now, and Lit is a major part of that. He is so good at almost every character he plays that you can't even say Sombra is his comfort pick anymore. He just plays everything. He's also integral in developing a new revolutionary training method in OWCS, where they don't scrim and play the game for 12 hours every day, and they prioritize their own well-being over getting meaningless practice against trash teams. Everybody who talks about Lip says he's a great teammate, which is so much better than most of the other GOAT candidates that I've even talked about in this video. Whenever he's in the lobby, Lip is the guy. I know it's meat riding, but I would do more than that. When it slips out, I'm putting it back in with a smile. Not only does he have the most aura imaginable in the server, but simply, he is the best to ever do it. No man has ever demanded this much attention to be shut down besides other players on the list in their prime. And Lip's prime hasn't even started yet. He still has more to prove, but he is going to prove it. Lip is and will stay the greatest Overwatch player of all time. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe.